Well, good morning. I trust you've had a blessed week and been enjoying the lovely sunshine. I'd like to start this morning with a song called Thank You, Lord. A song that just gives thanks and praise to the Lord as we just thank him for all the greatness that he's bestowed upon us and all the things that we can see and the things that we can't see. But God's working for our good this morning. And he loves you this morning. So let's just sing together and just express in our worship our love for the Lord. I come before you today
Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Selah. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. The heathen raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. Come behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Good morning, friends. It's a real privilege to have the opportunity of speaking to you today and sharing something from the Word of God. And I want to say a word of thanks, first of all, to Jennifer for reading Psalm 46 for us, and also to Pastor Mark for inviting me to share this little talk today. Psalm 46 has a message of encouragement for God's people in dark days. The psalm divides very neatly into three parts. Verses 1, 2 and 3 are all about God's help in time of trouble. And I can't think of anything more important for us to consider at this time than the glorious truth of God's loving care and provision for the needs of his people. Across the world, millions have been affected by coronavirus, either by the fear of it, the reality of it, or the economic crisis created by it. And in such days of uncertainty, we want to know and to affirm with all our hearts that God is in control. He is sovereign. So verses 1, 2 and 3 of the psalm are all about God's help in time of trouble. And then verses 4 through to 7 focus on the inner resources of the believer. And again, I think this is very important in these days when so many of us are self-isolating or are involved in what they call lockdown. Isn't it good to know that when we don't have the immediate presence of our fellow believers as normally that we can still depend on the fact that in God himself we have an inner resource to strengthen us in the hour of need. The, the last little part of the psalm verses 8 to 11 tell us more about God's mighty power. You may have noticed when Jennifer was reading that each part of the psalm ends with a little Hebrew word that has not been translated into English. The little word selah. It probably means pause here and think about what you have just heard or read. It's an invitation to meditation. In our busy world, it's all too easy to read the Word of God quickly and lay it to one side and get on with the activities of the day instead of taking time to seriously reflect upon what, is, what God is saying to us through his Holy Word. Maybe in these days when so many of us are confined to the house, a little benefit of that may be the fact that we can spend more time not just reading God's Word but thinking about what God is saying to us through that Word. The very beginning of the psalm 
contains a little bit of instruction about its origin. We are told that it was to the chief musician for the sons of Korah. Now the sons of Korah were among the worship leaders in the temple and that little instruction at the beginning of the psalm makes it clear that this was intended originally to be sung in the corporate worship of the people of God in his house and the instruction seems to be that when the little word sila appears the musicians are to keep on playing but the congregation are silent in other words a little musical interlude to give time for reflection upon what has just been sung so whether you're reading the psalm privately whether it's being preached on in church or whether it's part of some choral production in the temple of old the same principle is there that as each section of the psalm comes to an end the people of God are being invited to pause to think to consider to meditate and to draw strength and blessing from what God has said I hope that when this little service is over you will read the psalm again in this way and that you'll pause at the relevant points and take time to ask yourself Lord what are you saying to me today through your word the first section then it's all about God's help in the hour of trial or trouble and in those verses we have a graphic picture of a world in chaos because of earthquakes floods violent storms volcanic eruptions and other kinds of disasters down the centuries human lives have been devastated by such things coronavirus is another in a long catalogue of troubles that have afflicted the human race in a sin damaged world we make our plans but they are so easily thwarted they come to nothing I think of the words of Rabbi Burns the Scottish poet the best laid schemes of mice and men gang after glay they don't work out the way we hoped or planned and in the light of this isn't it wonderful to read God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble his help is available to us wherever you are this morning sitting in your own home probably I want you to know that whatever your circumstances may be whatever difficulties you may be going through whether coronavirus related or of a completely different sort the truth is this God cares for you he surrounds you with his love he upholds you with his everlasting arms his presence is with you today and you can know his strength and his help you can find refuge from the storm in him another little phrase he is a very present help in trouble very present simply means his help is available right now here and now another translation renders it that his help is readily available there's no use having a place of refuge or safety if it cannot be reached when needed across the world there were fortresses into which people could flee in ancient times if an enemy approached you can see the ruins of such fortresses in various places here in Ireland places where our ancestors would have hastened when enemies approached 
to find safety. They bring themselves and their families and probably their cattle and sheep as well into the fortress to be safe. But one thing is obvious. Such a fortress would be no good at all if you couldn't get to it in time. It had to be readily available. And here we're being told that God's provision for our safety is like that. It is readily available in the time of need. When the enemy comes in like a flood, we're told elsewhere, the Lord will raise up a standard against him. Or as we read in Proverbs 18 and verse 10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. This wonderful assurance of help and refuge helps to take our fears away. The human reaction to disaster is fear. But it shouldn't be so for God's people because the Lord himself is our refuge and strength. So we don't need to be afraid. Think of the words of Psalm 23, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Even in that darkest valley of all, we can be comforted, we can be reassured and strong because the Lord is with us. Psalm 46 has an historical setting. It was written against the background of a particular event in the history of Israel. And that event was the deliverance of Jerusalem from the armies of King, Hezek King Sennacherib of Assyria in the days of King Hezekiah. You can read the whole story in 2 Kings chapters 18 and 19. In the days of King Hezekiah of Israel, Assyria was the world power and the Assyrian armies were infamous for their violence and cruelty. They were a dangerous and bloodthirsty enemy intent on the utter obliteration of the people of God. And they approached Jerusalem intent on destruction. And doubtless fear filled the hearts of the people in the city. You see, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, had a 100% record of success in his military campaigns. Every enemy he had attacked had been defeated. Every city he had be be besieged had fallen. The Assyrians seemed invincible and certainly King Sennacherib thought that was true of himself. Before his armies even arrived at Jerusalem, he sent messengers with threatening messages for the defenders and for the king in Jerusalem. The messenger said something like this, don't let Hezekiah deceive you. No God of any nation was able to deliver his people out of my hand. So shall not the God of Hezekiah deliver his people out of my hand. We find those words in 2 Chronicles 32 verse 17. And notice what's happening there. Sennacherib is not only mocking Hezekiah, He's not only mocking the people of Israel, he's mocking and belittling Almighty God himself. And as we shall see in a moment, that is a very dangerous thing for any human being to presume to do. He sends a threatening letter to Hezekiah. Again, warning of the dreadful things that will happen to Jerusalem if he does not immediately surrender. 
Hezekiah sends some of his counsellors to visit Isaiah the prophet, who is living in the city at that time. And Isaiah sends a message back to the king. And Isaiah said unto them, that's unto the king's counsellors, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumour, and shall return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. You find those words in 2 Kings 19, verses 6 to 7. What a wonderful prophecy. What a reassurance to King Hezekiah. God is saying through his servant, I want you to know that although Sennacherib has threatened and blasphemed, I am stronger than him. And Hezekiah must have been greatly strengthened by those words because later he addresses his people himself and this is what he says this is the king speaking he says be strong and courageous be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria nor for all the multitude that is with him for there be more with us than with him with him is an arm of flesh but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. Second Chronicles 32 verses 7 and 8. Have you noticed Hezekiah's unusual take on mathematics? He says there are more with us than with Sennacherib. Really? The Assyrian army was massive. Numbered in thousands. Israel's army was tiny by comparison and yet Hezekiah says there are more with us than with him. Was Hezekiah just bad at counting? Not a bit of it. He's em employing what I might call heavenly mathematics. The man, the woman, the nation that has God with them is always stronger than those who are opposing Almighty God. Even if the enemy looks all powerful, even if the enemy can be numbered in the tens of thousands, when we're with the Lord, when we're on the Lord's side, we're on the side of the majority. You may feel that all kinds of circumstances are ganging up against you at this time. You may feel yourself to be surrounded and under pressure, perhaps because of illness, perhaps because of economic anxiety. You may feel all these things. Remember this, as a child of God, with the Lord supporting you, you're stronger than all those enemies. Hezekiah had confidence in God because he was a man of God. Many of the kings of Israel and Judah were far from godly. The record of some of their kings is an appalling record of, of sin and corruption, and godlessness and idolatry, but not with Hezekiah. He was a truly godly monarch. We read in the scriptures that he knew God and walked with him. We're told he trusted the Lord, that he clave to the Lord, simply means he held fast to the Lord and he kept God's commandments because Hezekiah knew the Lord. He was able to have confidence in the Lord in the time of trouble. Dear friend, the better you know the Lord, the more strength, the more assurance you will have when the enemy comes in like a flood. Let's move on to the second part of the psalm, the inner resources of the believer. The greatest need in an ancient walled 
city under siege was to have a reliable water supply. So most cities in the ancient world were built beside or around a water source. But Jerusalem was not like that. It did not have an adequate water supply inside its walls. And this made it especially vulnerable in time of siege. King Hezekiah wasn't only a godly monarch, he was also a very clever monarch. Because one of the great things that he did during his reign was to organise the construction of a conduit or an underground tunnel to carry water from the spring of Gihon outside the city, right under the city walls, into the heart of Jerusalem, to the Pool of Siloam, thus providing his people with water in time of enemy attack. And this must surely have been in the mind of the psalmist who wrote Psalm 46. Not only is God our refuge and strength, he also provides for us the spiritual equivalent of an internal water supply that will keep us strong and safe in times of difficulties. Just as a city needs water for its people, so the believer needs the inner resources of God's divine presence. I read in verse 5 concerning Jerusalem, God is in the midst of her. And I link that to Isaiah 41 and verse 10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Oftentimes I've heard Christians say when they've gone through a particular time of trial, I could not have coped without the Lord. And when we hear words like that, we know exactly what is being said because our experience has been the same. When we've gone through times of difficulty, it's been the sense that the Lord is there with us. The Lord is sustaining us, that has kept us and brought us through. Our Saviour spoke about us having a spring of water welling up inside us. And the Gospel commentator adds the words, this he spake of the Holy Spirit. Dear friends, if we're saved by grace, through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ upon the cross, we are indwelt by God's Holy Spirit. The Spirit dwells within. He becomes the divine internal resource to strengthen us to stand in days of trouble. If you're saved, you have God's Spirit dwelling within you, that inner resource to keep you strong. The timing of help is crucial. Sometimes perhaps you've needed help in a certain area and somebody has said to you, don't you worry, I'll give you a hand and you feel so encouraged by that and three weeks later or a month later they turn up long after the problem has passed. They meant well no doubt but they were so busy the days became weeks and the weeks became a month before they remembered they promised to help you. The help was genuinely meant but it didn't arrive in time. I'm glad God's not like that. When he promises his help, it is there when we need it. 
We have these words in verse 5. God shall help her. Again, the her is Jerusalem. God shall help her and that right early. This has been translated as God shall help her just at the break of day. And this again refers directly to God's deliverance of Jerusalem in the days of King Hezekiah. As darkness fell, the defenders on the walls of Jerusalem looked out and all they could see surrounding them in every direction were the armies of the Assyrians. There was no way of escape. There was no way that their few in number could resist the mighty force that was encamped against them. And as they went to their beds that night, they must have been tossing and turning rather than sleeping in fear and anxiety, contemplating what would happen the next day when the enemy attack was launched. But while they worried, God was at work. And the scripture tells us when they arose early in the morning, Behold, the, the Assyrians were all dead corpses. When the guards on the walls of Jerusalem looked out at daybreak, instead of seeing a massive living army surrounding them, they saw nothing but the dead. In the night, God had destroyed the entire Assyrian army. And that wasn't all. Exactly as Isaiah had prophesied, King Sennacherib heard a rumour of rebellion at home and he gathered together what few troops remained to him and he hurried back home to Assyria only to be assassinated by his own sons. And again we're reminded what a dangerous thing it is for a man, even a mighty king, to defy the God of heaven. The enemy was defeated and King Hezekiah's soldiers didn't even have to draw their swords out of the scabbard. God did it all. I note in verses 5, 6 and 7 these truths. God is in the midst. That speaks of stability. God helps. And the timing of his help is always perfect, just when we need it. God speaks. And every enemy voice is silenced. And every enemy threat comes to nothing. God shelters because he is our refuge. Very quickly, the last little part of the psalm simply dwells on the glorious truth that God delivers his people. The psalm invites us, come see the works of the Lord, what marvellous things he has done in the earth. That's one translation of verse 8. And I invite you to do exactly that. To consider the wonderful things that God has done in this world of ours and in the lives of each one of us. We may be surrounded by troubles, but we have a God who has already demonstrated his mighty power in amazing ways. That's what verse 10 means. Be still and know that I am God. Stop rushing around in frantic panic. Stand still, quieten your heart and see God at work on your behalf. On an occasion, the prophet Elisha was being hunted by his enemies. 
and the armies of King Ben-Hadad of Syria surrounded the house where he was staying with his young servant. And they were intent upon Elisha's destruction. The young servant opened the door first thing in the morning and looked out and all he could see was enemy soldiers surrounding them. No way of escape and he's terrified and Elisha simply says, Lord, open the young man's eyes and suddenly a miracle takes place and that young man's eyes are opened to see realities that were there all the time but which had been invisible to him up until that moment. He sees that between his master and himself and the enemy soldiers all around there is an intervening army of angels. They are absolutely safe because God has sent his heavenly host to protect them. And I would pray for myself in these days and pray for you as well that our eyes might be open to behold the power and majesty and glory of God and to see the way that he protects and upholds his people. There's a little refrain in the psalm, a little phrase that is repeated twice as if to emphasize it. It really seems to form the very core of the psalm itself. And here it is. You find it in verse 7 and verse 11. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. The Lord of hosts, Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, is one of the Old Testament names of God. And it reminds us of God's mighty power. All the armies of heaven are at his disposal and he is there for us. He's called the God of Jacob. And for the Israelite, that was simply a, a reminder that he wasn't just a God or even the God. He was their God. Theirs by covenant relationship. And friends, when we pray, we're not praying to a God. We're not even praying to the God. We're praying to our God because we have a relationship with him through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The little phrase says that the God of Jacob is with us. And I immediately think of the word Emmanuel, which means God with us. One of the names given to the Lord Jesus Christ. And because we are Christ's, God is with us. We're not on our own. We may be isolated from other Christians, isolated from the house of God, isolated even from family and friends. But there is one that no virus can separate us from, and that's the Lord himself. He is with us. And the little phrase finishes with the, the theme that seems to run through the whole psalm. He is our refuge, our place of safety. Dear friend, read the psalm again. Rejoice in God's goodness. Be encouraged by it. King Hezekiah centuries ago, was encouraged by a prophetic word from Isaiah. He encouraged his people with the same thought, and it was this, God is with us. The enemy may be strong, circumstances may press upon us, but with God supporting and upholding us, we can only enjoy his victory and his blessing. Thank you for listening, assuming you have been, and the Lord bless you. Amen. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Pastor Hilliard, for your word this morning. We're going to come around the table this afternoon and remember what it represents to each one of us. 
uh, who accepted him as their own personal saviour. This is a table of memories. The Lord tells us to do this till he comes. One of the things I watch is a uh, gold rush. It's about miners who dig for gold in the Yukon in Canada. When they go into a new piece of ground, they'll go and dig test holes, first to see if there's enough gold in the ground. When they get into the ground deep enough, they take the dirt from the ground and put it in a pan to wash. After pouring the water in, in and wash the dirt away until they're only left with the gold. As I watched this, I saw a picture of how we were unclean because of our sin. And when we give our lives over to God, he takes us, as it were, and puts us in that pan and washes us clean. Jesus didn't do this with water. Jesus went to the cross and washed us clean with his precious shed blood. Revelation 1 and verse 5 says, To him who has loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. The blood of Jesus, is, uh, of Jesus makes us who we are today. When I think of this, I'm reminded of the song. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. O oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon, this I see. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this I plea. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can my sin erase. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of works, tis all of grace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. O oh, precious is the flow. That makes me white as snow. No other fact I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. As uh, each of us gather in our different places today, let us join now and just lift up his name before we partake in the animals. Praise you, Father. Lord, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for sending your son to the cross. Jesus, we thank you for coming. You alone are worthy. Praise your holy name. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness upon uh, on each one of our lives. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you did send your Son to the cross for each one of us. We thank you, Jesus, that you came to do the Father's will. You said, not my will, but thine be done. And Lord, we thank you just for your precious body that was broken for us on that cruel cross. And for your precious shed blood that washes us from all our sins and all our impurities. And Lord, there's no other way, only through the cross. So Lord, take our thanks this day, Lord, as we come around the table right now. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Just for, before we partake of the albums, let's read 1 Corinthians verse 11, or, um, verse 20, sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I have delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he had broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Thank you once again for joining with us this afternoon. Now Paul is going to lead us in some more praise and worship. God bless. I'd like to close this morning with, with the words of this song, Jesus at the center. And I hope and pray that this morning Jesus is at the center of everything in your life. The center of your home, the center of your family, more importantly that he is the 
at the center of your being. Let's just sing this song together. Let's give thanks to the Lord. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end. It will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus, but nothing else matters. Nothing in this world will do. Jesus, you're the center. Oh 